this panel, we're going to be exploring behind the label and we're going to be really talking about supply chain and kind of what goes on behind the scenes. So according to Business of Fashion, and we've also heard from Kate earlier today, um, second only to oil, fashion and textiles is the most polluting industry in the world. So at every stage of the garment life really threatens our planet and its resources, and it can take up to 20,000 liters to produce one kilogram of cotton, the equivalent to a single tee and a pair of jeans. And up to 80,000, sorry, 8,000 different chemicals are used to turn raw materials into clothes. So these facts are pretty scary and pretty difficult to ignore um, in these kind of forums. So what really happens along the way? How can the fashion industry become more sustainable and transparent? And what can we in Singapore do to really raise awareness? So that's exactly um, what we're going to hopefully answer today. So no pressure, guys. <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce uh, each of the panel one by one. They're going to share a little bit about their stories uh, and their insights, and then we'll open up the floor to some live Q&A. So let's start with Leslie, the founder of Transparent Supply Chains, um, which helps big companies be more sustainable. And she's also a human rights lawyer. My name is Leslie Shiverton, and I'm the founder of Transparent Supply Chains. I've been in Singapore about three years now, and I'm so excited to be here today. And before I talk about Transparent Supply Chains, I want to talk a bit about what field kind of we fit in to kind of frame the frame of reference. So we fit in the corporate supply chain responsibility field. And really what that looks at is kind of the, the impact that especially large major retailers have on both the environment and on society. And we'll talk a lot about the environment today, and Kate hit on some excellent points already. But where my work really fits is the kind of society piece. And more specifically, it really looks at the production aspect and, and really kind of the labor and the ethical um, portion of fashion and, and, and the worker bit and the worker welfare conditions actually in the facility. And where our field kind of came out is really kind of came out of these, these sweatshop exposés that happened really heavily in the 1990s and 1990s. You'll remember Nike in, in, uh, in Pakistan with child labor, uh, Kathy Lee Giffer with Walmart in, in Guatemala. And most recently today, as well, we talked about it, Kate really hit on uh, Rana Plaza. If some of you aren't familiar with Rana Plaza, it was the garment facility in Bangladesh that basically collapsed in on itself and it killed over a thousand people, mostly garment workers and, and mostly women. And so all of these events have really asked of consumers and civil society and governments to say, really, you know, what responsibility do these, especially these large global retailers and brands have for the working conditions in their supply chain? Especially if they don't own or operate these facilities, what responsibility do they have, you know, for them? And so what's kind of come out is the, you know, these corporate codes of conduct and basically these pieces of paper that say, if you're going to do business with us, you have to use, um, you have to buy by certain types of rules in order to, to work with us. And these rules kind of focus on things like child labor, making sure everyone's of age working in the facility, forced labor, everyone's there voluntarily, uh, working hours, that people are not working 100 hours per week making garments, uh, health and safety, uh, especially related to fire safety. This is a picture of the Tarzan facility in Pakistan that burnt down in 2013. The textiles are incredibly flammable, so if one goes up, it's, it's very likely that the whole the whole building can, can quickly go up as well. And the environment. And this is, I think, a good visual for what Kate was mentioning before about like wastewater discharge. Uh, going directly sometimes into to local water supply. This was it's a bit of an old picture from a Levi's facility in Lesotho, but it was a denim facility where the blue dye was literally going into the, the local river supply. What I work on though is really kind of the the assessment aspect, you know, the labor aspect of, of how do brands and retailers actually check to say we have this code of conduct, how is the facility actually abiding by it? And so they actually send people out in the middle of, um, you know, all over the world to check on these conditions of facilities. And they primarily do it at the manufacturing sites, so where you actually cut and sew. And then also um, they do them all over the world. Uh, you can kind of see a few of the spots here. And what do we do? We empower sustainability professionals and really empower them in two ways at Transparent Supply Chains through our website, which is the online resource, and also um, through our consultancy. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Great. Yes. Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> so at the moment, are there any projects that your organization is working on with people in the fashion industry? 
Uh, yeah, we're working on a, a really exciting one with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. And really, they're a, a facilitating group that brings together large brands and retailers to address big systemic sustainability issues. And the assessments I was talking about right now, they happen very individually. Like, so Gap has their own team and um, H&M has their own team. And they do tons of thousands of assessments every year. So for a factory that has 20 brands working with them, they may do, you know, 40 assessments per year just on the social side. So what they've come together is to create a common framework for the apparel and footwear industry to compare apples to apples on all those issues I talked about before. And um, our organization is the developer of that tool that they're trying to create. Amazing. That's really, really exciting that that's happening. Um, and then all types of industries, I mean, not just fast fashion. And again, you know, Kate was talking about fast food and, and everything, uh, have the potential to not be sustainable and have kind of, you know, sweatshops. So how is fashion, you know, the supply chain different from other industries like, you know, electronics or food processing or something? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, I think the biggest thing is, is the margins, right? The margins are so razor thin. In, in garments, aren't they, versus uh, other types of uh, products. And, and because of that, uh, that piece, and I think the, 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 the fact that, you know, it's pretty easy to create a facility, like a garment facility. Like you don't have to have much, right? You just need, you need sewing machines, you need labor, you need some lights on, and you need a ceiling. And so the labor ends up being your largest cost. And so when these margins are pushed and they're really pushed down, that means the labor portion gets pushed down. And that means that the destination for that manufacturing gets pushed down as well. So the, the search for the, ch- the cheaper uh, option for, you know, in relation to like a country continues to go. So right now we're going into Myanmar next with garments. Uh, Ethiopia is an interesting um, new location for garment manufacturing. Again, looking at that, that, um, that low cost. So now we'll hear from Ren, so the co- the founder of Matter Prints. They're an artisan eco-warrior brand who are pants to see the world in and all of the team is wearing, as I told you earlier. Um, so Ren, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, well, first of all, it's fantastic to see so many people wearing Matter today. Yay. It's a really <laughs> nice vision for the future. Um, I'm going to keep this short because I always think the Q&A is the best part. But um, just a, a, bit more, a little bit more about the personal side. Um, I started Matter because of the people side. So like people, planet, um, and animals, I would say I was more on the people side. I really wanted to, first of all, show two things. One was that we have amazing Asian textiles in this region and amazing artisan stories here that are not being celebrated. And I really wanted to celebrate that. That comes from my sociology background. And the second was that, you know, responsible goods do not have to be brown or sucky <laughs> in forests. And that, you know, it was possible to create something that was um, desirable, that you could wear for a long time, and that people thought was cool, because I really thought that the next generation of consumers have to feel that something is cool and to believe in the product first um, before understanding the process behind it. So those were my first two big intentions. Um, it's been about two and a half years into this journey. I am not from the fashion industry. I'm not a designer. Um, I probably would not have done this if I knew everything that was in it about the, <laughs> the millions of decisions in the supply chain. So that says the interesting part that I hope to talk more about in the Q&A. But, um, so Matter basically works with uh, seven different artisan groups in India um, across five different techniques, um, like 500-year-old techniques of uh, Jamdani, block print, e-cut, um, hand loom, natural dye. And we started with one product category, which is why everyone is wearing pants. Um, uh, we call Pants to See the World In. That was our first tagline. We've now expanded to jumpsuits, um, scarves as well. And we hope to become um, a premium textile brand. So everything that, uh, like bags, uh, what else can you make textiles, homeware and so on, that's what we'll focus on because that's where our strength lies. But we started with one product category because um, it's a seasonless model. And I think a lot of the problems with the fast fashion industry also comes with the creation of collections two to four times a year. For me, it was really like a practicality issue. I could not conceive of creating 20 different items. So, um, for example, uh, Stephanie's jumpsuit comes in three different colors. And, uh, you know, a year later, it will still be there maybe with two other colors. Because once you know your cut and your style and you love it, you probably will wear it um, again. In terms of um, impact, 
Um, our first uh, impact metric is the number of artisan days of employment that we generate. Um, because first you have to create demand for an alternative industry. So about 16 to 25 days of employment are created for every um, piece. And we measure maybe about 20 to 40 percent of our cost of goods that goes directly to artisan. So depending on the technique involved, um, we whether it's I'm not going to get too technical on that. Um, about 20 to 40 percent goes to them. Um, right now, we're focusing on just generating enough demand for artisan-made fabric, and that a lot of that is um, a combination of um, consumer education on the process behind it, as well as us refining our own uh, production chain to make that um, economically viable. I think 20 to 30 percent premium is about right. Um, in the future, we hope to do more capacity building, um, training, uh, innovation. Innovation, an example of innovation would be, for example, block printing on Tencel, which is a sustainable fabric, instead of cotton, which is the number one um, uh, fabric that all block printers use, um, as well as uh, providing credit facilities. So that's like very down the road, but I think all of that needs to come together in the ecosystem if we're, um, if we're going to support a different um, production chain. So I think a lot of um, consumers are becoming more conscious uh, and there is this growing demand for provenance. So people do want to know like where something came from, how it was made and kind of who was affected along the way. And I know that was something that Matter promised, you know, in the beginning to people. So all those things that you just shared, like it's amazing that you know all that information and that you're able to share that. But how easy is it to kind of, you know, actually be so transparent um, with your supply chain and, and kind of is there somewhere more you want to go with it? Um, I think it's actually very easy to be um, quite transparent in the supply chain. Um, that also is easier, I think, when you're smaller, because a lot of the decisions are personal. Mm. So provenance was always very important as a value, simply because I was asking the same questions that every consumer asks, because I didn't have the education, I didn't come from the industry. So for me, just the core belief for Matter, which is what we, you know, what I tell my team, is that every time you talk to someone, treat that as a transformational event, where you can have someone start questioning, like what Kate um, put up, where something comes from, who made it, what it's made of, and so on. We can't push everyone to make the same kind of decisions. We're not going to like tell everyone, like, no, you should support Craft in Asia. But it is, it is a core belief that if everyone did ask, like, am I wearing nylon or cotton? Is this made in India or Bangladesh? What is the difference? And um, why am I buying this? Which is number, question number one. Do I love it? How many times will I wear it? Asking those questions and having providing the information for people to be able to um, access that has been our core belief of how we will make change happen. So a lot of our um, marketing material, uh, how we connect with consumers is about that. In terms of how we carry that out, um, every product comes with a welcome card with like a location of where something is stitched as well as where it's woven, which really provides the first idea that like, okay, there's actually yarn, and then there's fabric, and then there is stitching, and then there is like that whole chain. So we provide GPS locations of where that is. We're transparent about the kind of partners that we work with. And um, when we first started, like the number of assessments on like just googling fair trade or like what is responsible supply chain practice was ridiculous. So a lot of the assessment of that is based on personal relationships. So a lot of the provenance information about our factory is on our blog with me in India being like asking questions like, so like where is the staff canteen? Is there separate toilets for men and women? Like or what is the ventilation like? What are the working hours like? And to be honest, at this stage, because we're small, a lot of that kind of so-called audit is on a personal level because navigating the, the uh, assessment, I guess, uh, ecosystem is quite complex. Um, in terms of provenance around process, we do a lot of videos and uh, information about what a process is like because we find that a lot of people are interested in craft but cannot fathom what is Ika, what is Jamdani, why does it matter, um, and who are the people who make it. So I guess just a quick one, like if there's someone in the room, <clears throat> one of the makers or someone that's looking to you know, get into the fashion industry, what... Like, how, how would they start maybe just a little bit of advice on if they want to have a transparent supply chain? Like, obviously, you're saying that you're going there physically <laughs> to these places, but is there any little tips that you can just give someone to think about now? Well, one, know why you are going into the fashion industry. This is super important because I wanted to give up a lot of times. And my why of wanting to, like, okay, this is all about the craft. This is all about artisans 
was uh, guided me to make certain decisions about the supply chain. So, for example, I had to give my initial idea was like everything is made in rural villages, including the garment itself. The garments came back, pants, like legs were funny, <laughs> and um, it was you know totally different. So you throughout the supply chain, there are so many minute decisions to make. Knowing what is your core purpose, whether it is to dress people in a certain way, to um, propose a certain kind of fabric more than others, knowing that one key thing um, is really important because you have to make so many other compromising decisions along the way. I mean, you might start with this like amazing big picture, but having drilling down to that one thing will help, I think, a lot. Your why, for why you're going into the fashion industry. Second, I think, is um, having... Uh, industry mentors and contacts that have the same values as you. That's really important. So I cold called and like LinkedIn connected and like Facebook messaged a lot of people, some who responded and some who didn't, uh, people in the industry who had experience in the sector that I was going into. Because navigating it by yourself is sometimes one, disheartening and also two, very confusing. So knowing who you can talk to about sustainable textiles, who you can talk to about um, artisan industries, who you can talk to just about like making garments um, is really important and in the beginning I had like a founding family of like 12 people in my team who were just friends and mentors and people who like were willingly giving their advice and contacts and I worked uh, professionally with an ethical supply chain consultant who I found online and through personal contacts as well um, so yeah those two things purpose and people Thank you. Okay, so now um, we'll have a little chat with Stephanie. Lots of Stephanies in the room today, which is so there's three of us. It's like, <laughs> um, so this Stephanie has always been passionate about vintage and unique designer pieces. Her company, Style Tribute, was born out of her vision to create a premium, safe, and hassle-free solution for high-end fashion connoisseurs to sell and buy luxury designer items. So, Steph, share a little bit more about that. Thank you, Steph, for having me. Um, so, as uh, Steph was explaining, uh, Style Tribute is a luxury marketplace that sells where you can sell and buy uh, secondhand uh, luxury goods. So, um, I'm, I'm mostly here to learn from these speakers and these experts, um, uh, you know, but um, I think the interesting part of the business model is uh, on one side the fact that we are in people's closets and uh, we, we get to see basically what's uh, you know, going on and, and how we consume. And the other part is we get to prolongate the life cycle of, uh, of goods and of uh, fashion pieces. So we get to give them, you know, several lives and, uh, and see that happening. So um, initially, uh, you know, I was uh, fascinated by vintage pieces. I used to spend a lot of time in markets back in Europe and, and in, in different thrift stores. Uh, seeking and, and looking for, um, you know, pieces dating back from the 60s or easy earrings dating back from the 80s um, just because those pieces were exclusive uh, because they were uh, with a lot of craftsmanship and artisan work uh, because they were exclusive. Um, but arriving here in Singapore, what I found was a, a, a very little inventory of vintage pieces uh, a very small appetite for, for this kind of market. Um, and what I found instead was going to uh, customers, uh, clients, and opening their wardrobe and just seeing an overflowing amount of uh, luxury pieces that were just sitting there. So we basically, you know, uh, kept, of course, the vintage part, which uh, remains my passion. Um, but mostly, you know, uh, enabled women to, to sell out uh, the items that were sitting there and, and uh, find a new home for those pieces uh, that, you know, other women could actually value. So, I mean, in the three years, like, how have you seen Singapore change, the trends, like, where is it kind of going? Um, and have you had to do a lot of education around this issue? So share a bit about that. Um, so definitely when I arrived, uh, you know, the, the business was, uh, not the business, but the market was uh, still very new um, and there was a lot of stigma around uh, secondhand, uh, you know, kind of shady perception around it. Uh, we specialize in, uh, in luxury pieces in, in uh, high end. Uh, so of course comes with it the issue of counterfeit, uh, that is a big one. Um, over the past three years, I've really seen a change of, uh, of perception around that. 
Um, it's still not at a level that is comparable to the US and Europe, um, but I do see a mentality change. Uh, the, the sad part of it is that um, you know, the intention and, and the incentive to purchase secondhand uh, luxury goods is not so much around sustainability. Mm. Um, it's more about the appetite around affordable luxury. Um, and, you know, I, I've been interested, um, since we don't design, create any goods, but we distribute them. Uh, we don't have control over the supply chains, but the least we can do is kind of interest ourselves on, uh, you know, the brands that we do um, sell on, on Style Tribute, which are uh, all the caring uh, brands, which are Gucci, uh, Stella McCartney, Yves Saint Laurent, uh, Chanel, um, all the LVMH uh, kind of brands. And um, what I see is that uh, what's great is there is a lot of investments of those brands in sustainability and in innovation around the production of luxury goods. Um, however, uh, they're not communicating around it. So, um, and the reason being is that, I mean, on one hand, uh, they depend heavily on these, uh, you know, products and, and these resources. Um, so they need to take leadership and responsibility on investing in new technologies and having control over the supply chain. However, there is a discrepancy, and it doesn't trickle down to the to the product communication part. Uh, just because consumers buy luxury for reasons that are not sustainability, they're uh, they're buying it for the romantic vision of it. They're buying it for quality, for exclusivity, for status, and so um, it's difficult, kind of, to fit in that sustainability message uh, in that whole uh, you know well crafted uh, luxury uh, communication. Um, so, so it's it's you know a big dilemma, and it's a bit uh, it's a bit um, I'm a bit uh, puzzled by it. Um, yeah, I've been talking a lot with with people working in those industries, and even from an employee uh, angle, you know they really see changes and uh, a lot of the uh, effort put into um, you know changing mindsets, etc. But to a consumer angle, it we just don't see it. So, um, yeah, that's that's uh, and and the problem is that they they're at the top of the fashion pyramid, so they should be initially the ones to put the effort to change mentalities, and they're the ones to dictate what is cool or what is not cool, what is the next trend for next next season. So they really have the power and the ability to make green fashion sexy, right? Um, the problem is like listening to a consumer or someone, your friend, bragging about the last uh, eco-friendly sweater she bought is, you know, as thrilling as <laughs> as having a conversation on air filters, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's, there's that issue. And, you know, I hope that the luxury brands will realize that, um, you know, if you look at the... the high-minded chefs, they were able to put into any foodies lexicon um, sustainability and, and organic and bio. Uh, you know, Tesla was able to make the electric cars uh, glamorous and, and et cetera, et cetera. So why wouldn't the luxury brands be able to make, you know, green fashion, uh, which wasn't sexy, sexy. So... I'm waiting for that. <laughs> I'm also waiting for it. And I think, you know, Ren, you mentioned as well, like you're, the way that you're doing it is, you know, making Matter a sexy brand and a cool brand and really like trying to connect. And obviously with Green is a New Black, we've tried to do that as well. <laughs> Have these conversations in a more fun way that is actually like approachable and that people are going to care about it in a, in a, you know, way that they're caring so much about that luxury good. So I'm, yeah, also interested to see who's going to be one of the first. I mean, obviously Stella McCartney uh, does a fair yes. bit. Um, but no one seems to be following her lead yet. So it'll be interesting to see who kind of steps up to, to that role. On with that, um, Graham Ross is our only man for this whole track. So Graham, thanks for joining. He is the CEO of Kusaka.
Athletic, who have also sponsored all of our uh, Green is a New Black Tees for the committee. So you'll see them running around. Um, and they are pioneers of sustainable sportswear and activewear. So over the past two years, they've researched, developed, trademarked four environmentally friendly plant-based fabrics. They have created the greenest t-shirt on the planet. And so we're super excited to have you here. So tell us a little bit more um, about your journey. And yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, everybody, for turning up. It's really heartening to see you know, a bunch of people care. Because when I, when I started this journey, I wondered if anybody actually did. <laughs> um, so just to kind of frame my journey, because like when I didn't have a background in the textile industry, I was in media for um, far too many years. Um, and this journey is very recent to me, but very personal. So um, everybody, can you raise your right hand? If, raise your right hand first. Come on, join me. Bit of exercise. Okay, now put it down if you've touched a textile today. Yeah. Had right? to think about that one. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's, a, that's a really small sample, but now everybody imagine, think, think about all your clothes in your wardrobe. Like, think about it really deeply. Dig really deeply in the dark holes of where you've got clothes stored. Okay? Now times that by 7 billion wardrobes. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the amount of textiles all sitting that we all have personal control over. Then now think about the, the seats you're sitting on, the, the clothes, you, the, the sheets you sleep on. The textile industry is massive, and um, I think as Kate explained this morning, the impact is, is incredible um, from a water perspective, from a land perspective, and from a waste perspective. And so I looked at my wardrobe a couple of years ago. It was piling up full of polyester shirts because I do a lot of sports and they give me a free shirt, which is great, but I wasn't wearing it. And I wondered why. And one day I picked up the label and I looked and I said, that's made out of polyester. And I looked at the rest of my wardrobe, it was made out of cotton and nylon. And I had no idea what those things were. So then I, you know, I got on everybody's great encyclopedia, Google, and went, what does that mean? And so then when I started to discover the impact, I went, like I was aghast, I'm going, wow. And I'm thinking, okay, so that's all happening. I understand we have fast fashion. Surely somebody's doing something about this. Surely there's a bunch of uh, brands that are making um, s uh, sustainable clothing. There was, but not at the scale it needed to be, and certainly not in the space that I was really interested in, the sportswear and active wear range. So I went, okay, well, why not? So I did a bunch more research. I found some fibers all over the world that were sitting in laboratories and, and sitting in factories not being used. And so I picked up the phone and I said, hi, I'm Graham. You haven't heard of me, but I'm really interested in your fibers. And I went, okay, <coughs> what do you want them for? And I said, I want to make sportswear out of them. And after a few conversations, it was like, really? We hadn't thought about that. So I managed to convince, is probably the polite word, a bunch of factories from all over the world to give me their fibers. And then I went, that's great. So now what do you do? So I Googled again, take fibers, turn it into fabric. Okay, right, so I need a factory. <laughs> so I went and found a factory, and I rang them up and said, hi, it's Graham. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a bunch of fibers you've never heard of, but I want to make sportswear out of them. And they went, okay. So over a period of two years, um, sending fibers into factories and learning, learning the supply chain as I went. And basically, uh, trying to convince a bunch of factories who were already making cotton and polyester that they needed to make my fabrics. And at times, from a supply chain point of view, getting bumped because I was only making, at that stage, a few hundred meters, um, bumped for an order. And so my, it was slowly, my timeline was extending out and extending out. We, we aim to make one fabric. We've made four so far. Um, and we're moving, where our R&D is going on from there. We're currently developing our own fiber. We've created remarkably two two fabrics that replace or as alternatives to cotton and two as alternatives to polyester. Um, so I made a fabric and then I went, okay, that's great. <laughs> I've just sp I've basically spent my children's inheritance. Um, <laughs> but I've got this fabric. So I need to imagine whether anybody cared like I did. And so I thought, okay, well I need to ask them, I need to ask the world. So I went back to the world and I looked in Google and they said there's this thing called crowdfunding. And, and this magical uh, destination called Kickstarter. And so I thought, right, well, let's, let's make something to go with Kickstarter. And um, I thought, well, okay, everybody owns a T-shirt. There's two billion T-shirts sold each year, which is remarkable. Um, and so I thought, well, let's make the greatest T-shirt on the planet. Can't be that hard. So what it gave me is the opportunity to look at a typical cotton T-shirt that, that we all own, and it gave me the opportunity to understand what that impact of that single garment was. And so 
you know, we've all talked about an average cotton t-shirt uses about 3,000 litres of water. I mean, it could be much higher. Um, organic cotton is about half that, which is great. Um, but our, 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 the garment we managed to create uses less than 1% of that. So 21.9 litres, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, we also, our garment also uses 80% less land, which is, which is when you start thinking about climate change impacting us in, in certainly, hopefully in the long term, but in the short term, um, we need that, we need that land to grow crops. So I think, I think pulling that back from, back into the, the topic, which is supply chain, when I came into this industry, I, I didn't want to be the next fashion brand. My idea was that we need to reimagine this industry. We need to reimagine a lot of industries in this, at this time, um, and we need to reimagine them for the future for our children and their children's children. And so I think part of the, uh, the conversation is great that we start to tweak the existing industry, looking at the manufacturing supply chain, looking at the waste. But why aren't we looking at new products, new textiles? Like we're a really smart race. <laughs> We can put people on the moon. You know, surely we can make the next cotton. And so, where? So I think that's kind of where we started. And so, when you look at that from the supply chain point of view, we just started sustainable. So, anytime we have to make a decision, is it sustainable? Yes or no? And that makes it really easy to business to go yes or no. Um, it's a really hard way to do things because a lot of the industry isn't set up to be sustainable. And so. Yeah, like Ren said, it's a, if I had known two years ago, <laughs> I had this bold idea. Um, you could have called me. <laughs> no, no. You can connect on Howdy now. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I think the other thing, the other thing I, I, we bring as far as the business is that it's about communication um, and it's about uh, collaboration. So um, we've got a bunch of ideas and we've got a bunch of learning, but my idea is to collaborate with as many people as possible. Because at the end of the day, we're all here for the same purpose, which is to make sure that the planet's going to be fine without us, but the human race isn't. And so I think as a business, as an individual, we have to go, do we buy from that, that brand? Is it is it sustainable? Is it, is it meeting you know our thoughts? Do I need to buy those clothes? And if I'm buying those clothes, um, are they sustainable? Where are they going to end up? My question is, and coming back really to the marketing aspect, and it's for all of you, but I think particularly for Stephanie and for Ren, how do you make it relevant and how do you make it sexy? What is the communication? I mean, if you look at Matter, it's such a successful brand, right? It, people across Singapore and Southeast Asia are wearing it with style, with confidence, and they're proud at the fact that they're wearing Matter and that it's a cool, edgy, and chic brand at the same time. But how do we make it sexy? How do we make it something that is accepted and something that is sought after? Because let's be honest, watching True Cost and telling the truth about it all, it's not pretty. And it doesn't make people want to buy. What makes people want to buy is, as you said, quality, um, finding the story. And for me, the luxury and the conscious consumer are actually one and the same because they're all seeking quality and they're all seeking story. So what is it maybe, Ren, from your side that you have done to make it relevant. And I think we had a conversation actually at a dinner party about it, about, you know, what do you talk about and what do you not talk about? And how do you make this whole concept of consuming responsibly attractive and desirable? Actually, this is a, it's a good question because we're at this point now, I would say we're, well, after two years, um, we've definitely caught a certain crowd that already care, that already, um, are attracted by this certain story. Um, I'll talk a little bit about where we came from and where we're going. So where we came from was just um, about exposure and telling the story in an engaging way in terms of appealing to basic human emotions of connection, empathy, and belonging. So that meant a lot of people stories. That meant telling uh, about the ecosystem of how craft is created. And I think people gen generally have quite a, uh, we have a common understanding of what quality means, like attention to detail, um, about intricacy, about the time taken to make something. And we also have a uh, common empathy for people involved in the process. So the way we tell our stories is like, 
Like this scarf, uh, Ojjam Dani scarf that we have, takes about 20 to 30 people to make across different processes. So understanding, I think, um, appealing to emotions rather than just like intellectual stuff um, and trying to evoke those emotions in our marketing materials, mostly through imagery and video and only certain chosen evocative words is what um, kind of got us, uh, I guess, more successful in the beginning and what um, got word of mouth and more shares. So just very focused on, on an emotional kind of storytelling. That was the beginning. <clears throat> I think now uh, the landscape has also evolved. So moving forward, I mean, it's a bigger question on just marketing in general. Right? <coughs> and uh, we're taking a more segmented approach. In terms of our customer base, we realize that um, there may be three types of main customers that, that usually fall into our bucket or that we meet. Um, first are the eco-warriors. These are people who are super learned. They ask, basically, asking questions already that makes you someone who is um, conscious, you're finding out what your fabrics are, you're making decisions based on that, you are asking questions. And so you are interested in transparency, knowledge, information. Um, so then the question here is, how do we get you to share with other people? How do we get you to convince that next person as a referral to make their first purchase? So that's our like marketing imperative for that segment. And the second segment is uh, textile lovers and craft lovers. And this is a growing segment in Singapore, surprisingly. Like the number of people who are making their own leather stuff or their own bookbinding thing or terrariums or like your own floral bouquets, like the whole maker movement in Singapore with what limited production facilities we have is definitely picking up. And I see that as um, a desire to return to understanding how something gets made, basically, um, being connected to the process of that as a, as a, not anti-globalization, but as a kind of reaction to that. So for us, then it's about um, the process, you know, marketing about the process of it, um, why it's beautiful and so on. And um, third category is uh, kind of creative, what we call creative travelers. People who love um, the creative side of it, the design side of it, people who love to travel, the com they love the comfort, versatility, and that's um, talking to them about the style of the pants, uh, about the story behind the print, about the design of, of that. So we're taking now a more refined approach to how we talk about it, not just talking about what we do, but about thinking about like what you care about um, in different buckets and like trying to give you that information. I okay. just going to say an example of um, that storytelling. Even as someone who's worked in this industry for 10 years, like I found myself also not having the, you know, beautiful products synonymous with sustainability. They were like two separate things. And, and I, I'm supposed to be like living this valley, right? And the, the watershed moment for me was a couple of years ago when I was looking at the Ann Taylor website. And Ann Taylor is not a, it's not a huge brand here in, the, in Singapore, but it's very large in the U.S., and if you go to the website, go to responsiblyand.com or something like that, and it's so beautiful the way they tell their sustainability and ethical story. I mean, everything from the color choices, it's like, it's pinks and nudes, and it's just, everything has an art to it, and it makes that, it makes it seem luxurious to own whatever that is, you know? And from the actual, you know, picture of a worker, uh, which, and again, you may be like greenwashing a little bit, but the workers beautiful themselves, you know, like they're, they're sewing your garment, like they're happy, the facility is beautiful, the facility has plants behind it, you know, it's like, that's where I want my products to come from, that's that's quality, so um, do check out their website, Responsibly Anne, for, for a good example. I think what we've gotten so far is that um, the spectrum of ethical and sustainable and the, the otherwise is a huge, complex and, and very, very varied spectrum that is difficult to navigate through, even for someone who's in the, the fashion industry. So if I can have everyone in the panel and also have Kate ex, um, maybe cite three to five things that people should look out for, quick facts, when I purchase something or look at a brand that will immediately tell me that, okay, this is kosher, or this I can look a, a little bit more. Um, I know Ren is uh, shaking her head. I have, um, that's why I asked this question that I think it will help all of us kind of try and navigate through the very difficult process of selecting products. I was shaking my head not because like, uh, I think it's really important. It's a great question. Uh, shaking my head because it's hard to tell from a single garment. But anyway, uh, I wrote an article on this for Honeycombers for this, uh, for Green is the New Black, so I'm just going to do it quickly. So it talked about four things. 
that um, that you can think about. Um, three things are on your garment already. So one is composition, definitely. So what material it's made of. Um, how you care about it and how you make those choices is something you have to read up about. Like why is nylon bad? Why is polyester um, not so great? Why organic cotton is better than cotton? So composition is one. Um, blends, like so you'll say like 90%, 5%, 5%. That already is like, will lead you to Wikipedia. Um, second is care, how it's uh, cared for. Um, if you can care for something at 30 degrees machine wash uh, or hand wash, will be the best. Line dry, no tumble dry, understanding what, like 70% of a garment, garment's energy footprint is in its aftercare. Um, so look at how it's cared for, what dry clean means, for example. Uh, third is, is understand what made in means and what the ramifications are. Like made in India, made in Italy, made in France. It's not actually that simple. So something that is made in Italy can be 95% made in Turkey and 5% finished in Italy. That you have to look at a brand's website and their transparency policies. And if they're not transparent, then you have to ask why are they not transparent and so on. And the last thing is what Kate talked about in terms of cost per wear as a personal decision. I'm more in the, on the life cycle aspect of, of uh, products. So uh, since I, I started South Tribune, I guess when um, you know I look at products um, and, and new items that I'd like to purchase, um, you know, on top of looking at the composition, the real question I ask myself is, okay, how many times am I really going to wear this product? How how long am I able going to going to be able to keep it? And if I do get tired of it, what's the value of this product uh, that I'm able to to you know pass pass through after once I've used it and optimize you know the use out of it. Um, so if you look at you know products from Forever Twenty One H and M and stuff like that, I'm sure you all made the experience yourself. After a couple of washes, um, you're not going to be able to pass it to anyone. Uh, you know, even your sister is not going to want it. <laughs> so um, whereas you know quality products normally uh, are made to, to last. Um, so those you know, uh, even though you 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 might at a certain point. Uh, grow out of it, be able to find, you know, someone that does find value and uh, find pleasure to wear it. I've been extensively living in Indonesia, Philippines. Home base has been in Singapore. And if you go to the interiors, even in India, there are a lot of small scale industry. There are families who have certain skills. And if you look at their products, they are very, very ethical. They're all organic. They, they always do it that way, but they're dying. Because nobody picks them up, nobody buys. The father is supposed to teach the son. I saw the son uh, on the auto rickshaw because there's no money in the family that comes from these things. So we're picking these up and we're bringing this into mine to bring it into an into open platform. So I'm absolutely open to collaboration. What I would like to hear from you guys is, is it an emotional thought or is it possible to bring these guys and make it sustainable? Because if these guys are sustained across a platform, they tick all the boxes that we are talking of. They do organic, they do ethical, they do all the things that we would like to promote, but I don't know whether it is sustainable and feasible. I think that's a really interesting slice of the textile industry to tackle. Um, I think the key word is collaboration. There isn't a, there, there's got to be framework set up, but I think the way we can make a change in the industry is taking a slice of the industry and, and then working on that. So if you can own that section where you can create a, a structure mm -hmm. that you can um, harness those individual uh, factories and then be able to be the middleman or the, the conduit to get into places who are looking for that. So I'm sure we've all intimated, when you've got an idea to start a, start a brand, you've got no idea to go where, where, do you, where do you start, right? And so these smaller places, are, uh, they're, they're not seen. So is there an opportunity to, to create some sort of website where these guys can go? So as an independent, anybody can go and look at them anytime. But then you also need to go across that. It needs to be a direct human-human contact. So with us, how, how we, I've spent a lot of time with my supply chain. Like when I've been to the factories, um, my conversations have gone from dear Mr. Ross to hi Graham, how was your weekend? And that's the kind of relationship you've got to have with your supply chain. <coughs> There's so many moving pieces of the supply chain things fall over yeah. and you've got to have communication. So if you can establish a communication from there to people like us who are looking for the product, then I think you're, you're going to the right way. So thank you guys so much. Um, of course, our speakers will be here in the break if anyone has any further questions and you can also message them on Howdy.